everybody, this is Karen from Singing Creek Educational Center and welcome to our September homeschool curriculum. Today we're here at Al Kennedy High School and we're going to be talking with Matt Hall. Matt is a transition specialist, garden coordinator and crew leader and we're super excited to have him lead us through the garden and show us all about plants, the seasons and what's happening here in their garden. And as always, we've got Brookie here. Brooke the history dog will help us go along and learn more about the plants. Singing Creek Educational Center acknowledges that we are on the traditional land of the Kalapuya people, past and present. We recognize and honor their ties to this ancestral homeland and wish to express our gratitude for their stewardship of this place. Hi there, my name is Matt Hall, and as you can tell, I'm originally from England. I ain't from around here. <laughs> and um, what we have here is a large garden, native plant nursery, orchard, blueberry bushes. Um, a lot of this was built up um, with a farm to school grant that we got two years ago that paid for us to buy these trees and then every every student in the school planted them with uh, um, with uh, under the guidance of Richard Sedlock and um, the long-term project with these trees and they are a mixture of apples Asian pears prunes and green gauges which are a form of prune and the objective with the the apples and the pears it's probably going to be to squeeze them into apple juice which we can then pass out to the whole school district and I have a question for you Matt so can you tell the kids what a native plant is yes as uh, Bill Mollison said all plants are native to somewhere <laughs> so anyway native plants are plants that originated here in the Willamette Valley or at least were here when uh, white settlers moved here so you have native plants. A plant could be naturalized, which means it was brought in from somewhere else and finds itself so at home that it, it settles here and, and does well here. You could say that blackberries were naturalized. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're also a noxious weed. So then you know, noxious and invasive weeds are weeds, plants that were brought in here and just took off because they have no natural predators and the conditions are just perfect for them and they're hard to control. And that's one of the things that we do is chop down and dig up blackberries and pull scotch broom. Ah, scotch broom, yes. Yep. I've heard of that one being yep. a terrible one to try to get rid of. And the native so. plants were uh, native to here and they, they originated here. They evolved here and, and as Miss Rainsong is probably going to tell you at some point, or maybe already has, a lot of them were used by the, the indigenous peoples here, the Native Americans, the Kalapoos. Mm -hmm. Yes, Should yeah. Should we move into the... Yeah, garden? let's move into the garden. Oh, we're going to look at some really interesting pollinator garden plants here. So Matt, what have we got here? This is a pollinator garden. In particular, it is designed um, to help the monarch butterfly. These are milkweed, showy milkweed. This is a milkweed pod. You can see the seeds coming out. Oh, and there's a bug in there too. A bug in there too, yeah. Nice. Yeah. And the seeds are perfectly stacked wow. in here. If we can pull this out, you can... Oh, we've got several bugs in here. <laughs> several beetles. And you can see how these the seeds are kind of stacked up in there. Oh, yeah. On this silk. And they have like a parachute they to do. catch the wind. They have a little parachute on them, yeah. Wow, it reminds me of uh, dandelion fluff. Oh, and there they go to make more milkweed plants. <laughs> there we go. Hi. Ah, they, run, they look like Dr. Seuss critters. <laughs> okay, so showy milkweed. This is native to Oregon, and it's called milkweed because... Oh, yeah, look at that milky there's sap. There's a milky sap in there, which is poisonous. Oh, Yeah. so don't eat that. So don't eat that. So the... Um, and you can see it dribbling it's out of where... It's dripping. It does it look there. like milk. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So what happens, for those of you who don't know, this is the host plant for the monarch butterfly and the caterpillar eats the leaves. They the leaves by putting milk in them. 
the caterpillar then becomes a poisonous caterpillar, and so nobody will eat that caterpillar because mm. it's poisonous. And then, and that's why the monarch butterfly has that strong orange color. Mm. It's to warn predators that it is poisonous ah. and not to bother trying to eat it because it it maintains a, a poison in its system. Oh, that's great. The bright colors. Yes. Let them know. Don't eat me. Yeah. yeah. What else is around here that's for pollinators? This is a solitary bee nest block hotel, you could say. <laughs> and these are bees that um, don't live in hives. They don't sting. They lay their eggs in holes in wood and then they seal them up with um, clay. You can see this one here. This hole here is plugged with clay. So there'll be probably eight or ten eggs back in there, each one compartmentalized with clay. And the, the mother <coughs> lays the egg and then she goes out and she gets some pollen and she puts the pollen in the compartment for the, for the, the baby to eat when it hatches. This is probably a leaf cutter nest right here, leaf cutter bee nest right here. Because they plug their nests with leaves and then looking at the same log you can see this little hole has been filled and then this little hole up here has been filled and those are little tiny pollinator bees one of which might be buzzing around right now. Oh, can you see it landed on there? Oh, there he goes. Is it going to go in a hole? No, nope, it's not. Oh, maybe. Mm -hmm. oh, there he goes. Did you catch that? I think so. All right. Okay, and then the, this rat wire here is to stop the woodpeckers coming along and, and eating the grubs. Oh. Woodpeckers have long tongues. Oh, right. So it didn't get as populated as I was hoping. In fact, I'm quite disappointed in this, this lack of... of um, nesting going on but there's one there's a mason bee nest right there right there's one so there's one here I'll point to it from the side there's one right there you can see that mud where it's capped off <laughs> my students built this and, dr and drilled all the drilled all the logs oh, that's so cool yeah and so the, when these guys hatch out, they will, they will mate here and they will come back and lay their eggs oh. in those holes. And it's, they only live for one season. Oh. So they hatch out, mate, lay their eggs, die. Short life. <laughs> That's so cool. I've never seen, a, I've never seen a, a hive like this before, or a hotel, what did oh, you? Oh yeah, it's a, it's a bee hotel. Bee hotel. Yeah, I've never seen one before, just honeybees. Right, right. So this is, it's becoming, since the honeybee is tending to collapse, mm -hmm. these, it's becoming more and more obvious that these, that these pollinators play an important role in, in pollinating plants. It's thought that, it's thought that at least 30% of the plants that we use as food are pollinated by solitary bees rather than, um, rather than honeybees. So Hive bees. Why yeah. we do this? Wow, and things then are. Over dying. on this side of you here is a native plant nursery for Lane County. Oh. So, so we grow these plants for them. We dig them up and then we plant them out at Quamish Prairie, which is just north of Creswell. Mm hmm. These and ones with all the flowers? Yeah, the you can little... see the pollinators working them. Oh, right? look yeah. At all those little pollinators. Little on bugs there. and it looks like yeah. little bees they're and things. They're little bees and they're not honeybees, they're, uh -huh. they're little solitary. Bees. What are these called? These little flowers this is, here. This is Hall's aster. Oh, I thought it was an aster. Yeah. yeah. It's really see, pretty. Look at all those little tiny bees. Oh, yeah. It's just full of them. See them? And they're not the kind of bees that sting. Mm -hmm. they're, they're solitary bees. Oh, yeah. They're super tiny. Yeah. Oh, that's great. It's nice that there's a bee that doesn't sting. Mm hmm. There are many bees that don't sting. Wow, there and they're, sure and are. They're generally all solitary. Oh. And we can look at that as we go out. We'll show you the bee hotel that we built. Oh, and there's some butterflies too flying around. Some yep. little little orange ones. Yep. 
So what does that mean, succession? A succession is, is when you have a plant doing some particular activity, such as flowering, followed by another one that flowers, and another one that flowers, and that happens later and later through the year. So oh, nice. your early spring flowers are finished, then you get your late spring, spring flowers, which are finished, then you get your early summer flowers, which then finish, then you get your midsummer flowers, and so on. So that's that so there's it? so yeah so okay. there's always something for the pollinators to eat. Exactly, there's yeah. always something here for the pollinators to to, to forage. Nice. And then what else do you have? This is and you'll see more of this out there, and it's in various stages. This is goldenrod. Oh. And those little pollinators love that also. Mm -hmm. And, and do they get do they get pollen or nectar from the they flowers? They get nectar from it. Ah, and they need lots of that to get through the winter, don't they? Yeah, they do. They get nectar from that. But in exchange for them getting the nectar, the, the flower requires that they take the pollen with them. Oh, really? And take it to another flower to pollinate the flower. Oh, That's well. the deal. It's That's the deal. Hey, you want the how sugar? they pollinate. You've got to yeah. carry, the, you gotta carry the, the pollen. So it just naturally sticks to their little fuzzy bodies yep. and they bring it to the next yep. flower, right? Yep. Oh, and there's a beautiful little white butterfly, too. Off in the distance, you can see the white flowers. Yeah. That's, that's western yarrow. Oh, which okay. Which also has a really long flowering period. Okay, it let's go take really, a look at that. It starts really early and, and just keeps going. So I have heard that yarrow is actually um, that if you dry the flower heads and then you steep them like tea, and you boil it and breathe the steam, it's supposed to be uh, really good for hay fever allergies. Oh, There's okay. something in the flower that's medicinal right, right. for I mean, hay fever. Yeah, my family dries it and makes a tea out of it for the winter. We drink it, yeah. Nice. Okay. Oh, what did you pull up? This is yompa. Oh, I've heard of that. Yompa, which is another Native, mm -hmm. Native American Kalapuyan food source. Mm -hmm. So what we we planted things that look like that. Mm hmm And this is what we get. Oh wow. So there's the Yampa tuber. Oh. It's right? tiny. And it grew into that. Wow. In one year. And so this was used by the Native Americans for food? Yes. It was dug up yes, and it's, it's, did they dry it like camas and pound uh, it into I flour? Think they or? probably just roasted it and ate it. Oh. Okay. Does it usually get bigger than this, or is this about the um, size? I don't know. This is the first time we've grown it. Ah. But like I said, we were given a, a, a bunch of tubers that were about this big uh -huh. that we planted, and and, in, and then it became this, which is also kind of strange. It looks like it's mm -hmm. got little tubers that you could break off there and plant. Uh huh. Right. Look. So, you, so there's one there. Oh, oh, there we go. See, there's another. I could pro plant that, and it'll probably grow into a different plant. Uh huh. So you're going to yeah. spread that out in the garden and plant more of it for next year. Yes. Awesome. Oh, so you're putting that at Quamish Prairie to, to bring native plants back in. Correct, yes. Nice. Yeah. And then we make out of native plant milk into the garden. And we've got various different ways of doing things. This is, Ooh. This is a bed of cilantro that has now become coriander. Oh, look so at those, those tiny little seeds. They're really dry. They're really pretty. And they're very, they're very aromatic when you break them up. So this is a spice. Yes. Yeah, used in cooking. Am. Uh huh. There's Brooke sniffing around the garden. <laughs> she found something good. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> they, they, uh, we grew them on a, a segment of scrap fence. Oh, and they got and too, heavy. too heavy. They just pulled yeah. it right down, didn't and, they? And I like to grow them with, with, with what you call basil. And basil. I call basil because I come from England. <laughs> so I like to grow them with basil because they're a companion plant. And what does that mean? The com companion plants are plants that help other plants. Ah. And how, how do they help, the tomatoes? I'm not sure. But that's... And companion plant gardening is a 
a, a school of thought, right? It's mm -hmm. people have written books about it. I'm pinching the flowers out now because it's September, the, right? Yeah. And that's what we do. We don't want it to. We don't want them put to on new. Any more fruits because they're not going to finish them. We need them to finish the ones they've already got started. That's right. All these green finish ones. Finish what you started. Finish what you started. Does your mom ever say that to you? <laughs> finish what you started. Okay. Come and on, tomatoes. Over there, you can see we have Roma tomatoes, which are sauce tomatoes in cages. Oh, with the pretty yellow flowers. Oh, those marigolds or calendula, calendula. between them. Oh, that yeah. Calendula goat runs wild all through here. Yeah. As does the California poppy. But if we come up here, I can show you what I think is the best way to go to my Artichokes, these things. dried artichokes, yeah, these are really pretty. I love the color of them. The purple, it's lovely. Brooke, are you stepping on my lead? <laughs> <laughs> we grew these artichokes from seed. Oh, wow. From seed from They're the beautiful. artichoke we had in the old garden. Oh, and there's a bee inside that one, deep in the little purple tendrils uh, or some kind of critter. Some kind of insect. I, I see the little tendrils moving yeah, there. Moving. Like something is inside there. That, yeah. Is it a bee? Something's in there. Probably enjoying the pollen. Maybe it doesn't want to come out. It looks like a sea anemone. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> wonder what's in there. <laughs> nice. It's probably a bumblebee. So Matt, we have summer, uh, late summer gardening right now. What do you do in the winter time in your garden? The winter time in the garden, we could either um, cover crop the beds with a green manure crop that gets dug in in the spring and will provide fertilizer for the soil. Or we can start plants in pots in July and transplant them out into the bed in late August, early September, and these are what we call overwintering crops. Uh -huh. This one that you're looking at here is a cabbage called January King. All right. So it, it's going to grow slowly through the winter and head up, like it says, January, February, March. It'll produce oh, big, wow. big cabbage heads. That's great. So some things like the frost and the cold. Yeah, they like the cold. It's, it's, it's cold tolerant, which is mm -hmm. what makes it so so valuable in that and there are various there are overwintering cauliflowers overwintering broccoli overwintering cabbage wow the greens you can grow and, and, and collards can be grown through and what have you got there and i have fava beans right here these are fava beans in england they're called broad beans and you can see why they're, they're big they're, they're big and they're, they're broad and they're flat uh-huh this one is it's varieties Windsor Long Pod. And so when do you plant those seeds? We plant these September or October. Oh, great. And, and those they, overwinter and they grow too. through the winter. Uh -huh. And then you are harvesting them at the time when you're planting your green bean seed. Oh, okay. You're actually eating these, which is a wonderful thing. And they're really heavy producers too. Mm -hmm. They're not very well known in this country. But like I said, they're very common in England. You can even buy them frozen in the supermarket. Yes, I've eaten those yeah, and yeah. grown them before. Uh -huh. They're pretty big when they yeah. grow. These are, yeah. these are good ones. And I have various different kinds. I have some that I brought back from Mexico many years ago. Nice. They're yellow. Mm. Tell us about what you've got. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me introduce you to these this uh, this corn sister right here. So um, this first little block of plants here, four rows wide, ten feet long, and that's the minimum that they suggest you plant is four rows wide, ten feet long. It was actually a germination trial. My seed is old. This is from 2012. It oh says wow! On the on the seed packet. 
usual seed life one year. Huh. So I did a germination trial, and, and for the help your students here, germination on seeds is when they sprout. When you put them in the soil, you add water, and they put out a shoot and put out leaves. That's called germinating. And so I had those, and I had this early bantam, mm -hmm. which is only two years old. So I did a germination trial on both of these, and I got about 80% germination, which means eight out of ten seeds germinated. Great. So, and I was like, shucks, I should have done a couple of hundred <laughs> in the trial. <laughs> so then I planted these, and then the rest, after this tall stuff, the plants are shorter, right? They were planted from seed, and then over on that side, those were planted from plants that had started in that funny little greenhouse back there. Mm -hmm. So this... What I really wanted was to grow Hooker's, Hooker's Sweet Indian Corn. It's a blue corn mm -hmm. that is sweet but not too sweet. Mm -hmm. And, of course, its, it's seeds look like that. Oh, yeah, you right. can see that they're blue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. these are, and these are old, so they've faded a little bit. So what else we planted, of course, was this early golden bantam, which is... This color, the oh, color that right. you're used to, probably. Is right, orangey color. yellow, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then so, so then how the corn pollinates is it's wind pollinated. It's oh. not insect pollinated like the sunflowers and like a lot of other flowers. Corn is a grass. It's in the grass family. Oh, I didn't know that. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, then, and all grasses are wind pollinated. Uh -huh. So that's why you have to plant four rows wide, ten rows long, because the, the wind blows through here and it blows from the male flower down to the female flower, which is what becomes your ear of corn. Mm -hmm. right, this was the female flower on the, the, the silk on the end of the corn sample. Ah. And so if you wanted to think about it, the gene, we're talking about genes here, we're not talking about these genes, we're talking <laughs> about genes, G-E-N-E-S. Um, if you think about when your mother and your father came together and created you, that your father's and your mother's genes came together to create you. So you are a piece of each of those people, and then they are each a piece of their parents, so you also have bits of your grandparents in you as well, your grandmother and your grandfather from both sides of your family, your mother and your father's family. It's like that with corn. You can think of this, this is the dad, the father, and then the, the female flower is the mother that mm -hmm. becomes the corn. And of course, corn cross-pollinates very easily. If you have two varieties flowering at the same time, they will they will cross-pollinate. So mm. the, um, the various show and tell things. This corn flowered early. As you can see, oh, this is all blue corn. That's right? that purple color, that blue. This is mm -hmm. all blue corn. And there's going to be a complication coming in a moment. Wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> okay, there's the blue corn. I'm on the edge of my seat. Hooker's corn. And then the, um, the early bantam, which is a yellow flowering corn, some of it flowered at the same time. So now you can see oh, wow. that each of these each of these corn kernels is a, a separate pollination. Oh, so each one yeah. of these pollinated separately. So some see, pollinated with the purple and exactly. some pollinated with the yellow, yeah. right? Yes. And as you can see out here there was no pollination at all happened there for some reason. Uh huh. And if you look at this, there are all kinds of different colours okay. in there. There's yellow, there's, I'll take the glasses off to see. There's like speckledy ones, mm -hmm. right? And there's the dark blue, and there's ones that are speckled there. All right. Are there any other, are there any pinks? Pretty. Maybe a pink there. Yeah. Okay, so that's, a, that's a, an example of cross-pollination. The blue and the yellow both pollinated this, this mm -hmm. mother. Mm -hmm. And then the complication was, I also planted this. Mm -hmm. which is the hooker's blue corn mm -hmm. that we grew at the old school garden 
Uh huh. And we grew it next to pink popcorn. <laughs> Pink Which popcorn. Is, oh, look like at that. that. It's very pink. Yeah. yeah. It's very so small, those kernels. Popcorn, it, pops, it pops white, obviously. Uh -huh. And it's great. My wife loves it because you, you can even eat the kernels that don't pop. Yeah. Yeah, there's pink popcorn. Beautiful. So then, so that was the last time we grew it, those two together in the old school garden. So then, I didn't know this was going to happen. So then we get oh, this wow. happening, which is where that seed... Is, it's genetically is harking back to its gra its grandparents. <laughs> you can see the pink. So this is a this is a started off as a blue seed. Wow. This is the blue corn that has a little bit of yellow corn in there, right? Uh -huh. There's some white kernels. There's some pink kernels. Beautiful. Are you getting that? And I think what we see a lot of times is um, marketed in the stores as, quote, Indian corn is multi-speckled and multicolored like that. So it's maybe cross-pollinated with lots of different kinds. Yes, yeah, some, some native corns are multicolored. Mm -hmm. These are obviously little, reed, little, little, little small ears that we didn't eat. This yeah. is all past sweet now. It's all drying down to become dry corn. And we'll then grind it into flour, make cornbread from it. Oh, nice. Make yeah. some cornmeal. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. I love that. It's kind of a beautiful simplicity. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's, that's just the Four Sisters Garden. And this was a big experiment. Um, as you can see, I didn't plant them in mounds except for the squash. Uh -huh. the, the Hadassah Indians affect, I think, all Native American Indians who grew corn, beans, and squash, grew them on mounds. Mm -hmm. And I think that was partly because they didn't have irrigation, right? And so what they did was they made a mound, they planted their seed on it. When the crops were grown up a little bit, they dug around the mound and they threw soil up on there to, to, to act as a mulch mm -hmm. to keep the moisture in the ground. That's what I'm, I'm thinking is what they did. And one of the things I heard about it too was that um, the root structures are different on each plant so that the corn spreads out these real shallow roots so yeah. that it gets the first dibs on the water uh, that right. does come. And then the other plants like the beans and the squash have deeper roots and the squash will uh, curl around and snake around between the different stalks of the corn and, mm -hmm. and kind of find water wherever it can and kind of range out a little bit. And that the corn provided a nice straight, like a stick going straight up for the beans to climb up because they needed oh, something yes. to climb, like yeah. a ladder. Right. So that provided a structure for them. Right, yeah, no, that yeah. makes sense. And then, of course, the big squash leaves would provide shade mm -hmm. to help keep the moisture in around the roots of the other plants. Mm -hmm. So they all kind of work together like three sisters. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Matt. I had a great time in the garden with you, learning about the plants and the pollinators and all about genes. I really appreciate your time. All right. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure having you guys here. And I would like to encourage your students to start gardening. Maybe start small, maybe maybe next spring, maybe buy a tomato plant or start a tomato plant, put it in the pot, grow it up, and enjoy. Make something yeah. yummy out of it, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> it's good to grow your own food. It makes you more resilient and more self-sufficient. And it tastes good. Yes. Straight out of the garden, onto the table. And that's what I have to say. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you, Matt. Great, we love it. <laughs>